thank you and thank you for those kind words uh nan and i'm actually kind of glad you said them uh one because they're compliments of course but uh two <laughs> Two, because uh, it's part of the reason why I'm so excited to introduce Jamala. I think, at least locally, people um, often tell me and often compliment me, compliment me for the work that I'm able to do. But right now, I get the amazing opportunity to uh, introduce some, someone who's very much set the terrain that has made me and my work possible. And not just my work, but my generation's work. And so I'm very happy because I've looked to Jamala's work long before I even knew Jamala, right? And I've looked to her work long before I knew her name, right? So, I, so I'm very excited to have um, this opportunity and be able to introduce her. So Jamala Rogers is founder and past chair of the Organization for Black Struggle in St. Louis, where she lives and has devoted all of her adult life to creating a child-centered, family-oriented community, one that embraces, celebrates, and protects human rights for all citizens, regardless of race, ethnicity, class, gender, sexual orientation, or religion. Because of the persistent barriers to this goal, it has naturally led her to being a leader in the struggle for justice, equality, and peace. And so quickly to speak of uh, Organization for Black Struggle, which I'm a huge fan of and have been, um, as you know, many of the members of Freedom Inc. Young, Gifted, and Black got the opportunity to go and participate in the urban rebellion happening in Ferguson and also the work, the rebellion happening in St. Louis. And though it was not clearly shown on TV necessarily or clearly stated, is much of the gains that was made was, was actually able to be possible because there were people already organizing on the ground. Right? And so mad love to OBS for that. Mad love to OBS for that. All power to the people. Jamala has challenged the criminal industrial complex for decades, focusing on police violence, prison reform, wrongful convictions, and the death penalty. She's, she is associated with the exonerations of several Missouri men and women, including Ellen Reasonover, Joseph M. M. Ryan, and Daryl Burton. Currently, she is the coordinator for justice for Reggie Clemens' campaign, an inmate on Missouri's death row who many believe have been wrongfully committed and sentenced to death. Jamala is a featured columnist for the award-winning St. Louis American newspaper, St. Louis's largest black weekly, and is on the edit editorial boards of blackcommentator.com and the Black Scholar. Jamala was an Austin Bannerman Fellow and is the 2017 activist and resident at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Kajwa says hi. <laughs> Jamala Rogers' first book, the Best of the Way I See It and Other Political Writings, 1989 to 2010, features her essays from the St. Louis American on issues ranging from the church to human rights to black conservatives to war. Her latest book, Ferguson is America, Roots of Reve Rebellion, came out this summer. As one reviewer put it, Rogers does an amazing job of bringing clarity to exactly what's going on in our country, writ, writ large, and how long it's been happening. Do not make the mistake of thinking this book only applies to or commentates on the murder of Michael Brown. Rogers is giving all of America a sobering primer regarding the dynamics of race in our country. And anyone who reads it will most certainly consider it a call to action. So with that, I'm very pleased to introduce Ms. Jamala Rogers. My kindred. <laughs> Thank you for, uh, again, for getting up this morning. I am not a morning person, so to see other people up bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, I'm feeling already inspired. Uh, I do also want to thank all the folks who put this together, uh, especially the sisters at uh, Comparative U.S. Studies. And it struck me last night that the acronym is CUSS. So I kind of like that, because it might be some cussing out that that group has to do, because they're kind of off the grid doing uh, great things. And also to the Haven Center, who invited me to <coughs> participate in the uh, activists in residence. I, I'm so excited about that. I got a whole year to prepare for, but I'm still excited. So uh, without further ado, because we started a little bit late, and I actually I prefer to have more time for the discussion piece. Uh, so either I'm going to talk real fast or I'm going to like zero through some of these uh, slides. And there's not a whole lot of them, but I did want to do a few things with the PowerPoint. One is uh, I want to lift up some of the points in the book. Because when I say Ferguson is America, it, Ferguson is Madison, Ferguson is Milwaukee, Ferguson is all the urban areas where, where this kind of racial injustice exists. 
I also want to provide some historical context as well as some um, um, some ways of jump-starting the conversations later on and hopefully inform some of the other panel discussions. So, you know, hopefully we have an engaging, lively discussion. I'm not thin-skinned, so ask me hard questions. Uh, challenge me, because I do a lot of challenging other people. So I figured I'm going to get the same back in return. So I was really uh, fascinated by the fact that the title of today is Racial Justice, Incarceration, and Segregation, because those are at least two of the four points that I lift up in the book because these are the things that are part of the cauldron of inequalities and injustices that once that match gets lit, and usually the match is a police violence, then we have a Ferguson. So Ferguson really could have been anywhere. I was telling somebody last night that there are 91 municipalities all clustered together in the St. Louis region, and all, a number of them have the same in fact, in some cases, worse conditions than Ferguson. So when we sort of peel back the layers, we know that it could have been anywhere. Uh, but it just happens that it was Ferguson. So it was interesting that Nan pulled out some of you all's contests that you have won. Because in the book, I, I point out a lot of the things St. Louis has been noted for. And sometimes we've been on lists consistently. So for example, most dangerous city, most racially segregated city, most hyper-segregated city, least kid-friendly city, number one in racial mortgage rate disparity, the highest sexually transmitted diseases in the U.S., ranks 50 in state funding for public health programs. 50, stop it. And so I really have to sort of pin here that one of the reasons, and this is something that even St. Louisans don't know, the reason that we have a city hospital that's been closed up, boarded, leaves hitting up against the, the front door is because the lawmakers in Missouri had decided that they don't want to expand, expand Medicaid. So that, clo that hospital is closed down. It's a huge eyesore. And so that is sort of the pain we talked about living in America. So I want to move right to the, uh, the slide presentation. And I'm starting with housing patterns, because in St. Louis, um, that's been a key part. And, and, and you might know that I'm not originally from St. Louis, but I'm, I'm from Missouri, so the same thing. There's no, no real difference between these things. So in... Uh, for some of you all who are old enough to remember who reveals, you don't have to raise your hand, I'm not going to embarrass you. Uh, the interesting thing about St. Louis is that we had one of the largest Hooverville's and the longest Hooverville. And so I'm not going to say what a Hooverville is, that's an assignment if you don't know what it is. But 5,000 people lived there on the banks of the Mississippi. And these were shanty towns that were put together because of the policies and laws of of our then President Hoover. Uh, so the interesting thing about Hooverville is that because there were a number of uh, craftspeople, uh, folks who were put out of jobs based on the Depression, it made for a, a healthy mix of people who were very resourceful. So people were building their own places. They were electricians, so they were you know, wiring. I mean, it was, in fact, a city. And if, and, and, and the interesting thing, they even had his own mayor. I mean, it was like, you know, sort of, not officially, but when you got people living together, uh, you, you create a community, as messed up as it was. So almost uh, concurrent with that was a place called Mill Creek. And Mill Creek Valley was a place where 20,000 people lived, sort of near downtown. Um, 95% of these folks were African Americans. Uh, it was not the best place to live. In some cases, they were not running water, uh, no sewage. Uh, some of the main things that, that make a community at least safe and sanitary. But it was a community. You know, there were businesses there, churches were there, all that was there. Um, and it, it was over 465 acres, so it was a huge swath of land. And somebody got the great idea that, hmm, this is prime real estate. 
time to move the poor black people out. So they did. I don't know what happened to my other thing. Okay, we're gonna go. So a lot of this is sort of uh, places where there's overlap. In 1935, they decided they wanted to build an arch, and I know all of you all have heard of the arch, but it's got its own little ugly history, and the person that did the best job of exposing that is Tracy Campbell, who wrote about the St. Louis Arch, because it was wroth with, first of all, there was no black uh, workers on a federally funded project. That was the first thing. Second thing, well, even before then, they had tricked the voters with uh, voting for a bond for this, um, and so there were huge evidences of, of voter fraud. Um, and then there was the whole question of whether or not, they were, St. Louis had been trying to get this uh, WPA money and other kinds of monies. And so they came up with this bright idea of doing the arch. Well, they applied for a fund under the Historic Buildings Act. Huh? But what, what folks didn't understand, what they did was destroy historic buildings, and those bricks were sh uh, shipped out all across the country because St. Louis is uh, the mecca for bricks. Then there was Pruitt Igo. Uh, again, another failed pro uh, policy in terms of what do we do with poor people? What do we do with black people? And so this was a time during the early 50s that they started building high rise public housing. And the most notorious one was Pruitt Igo. Uh, and if ever there was a case study in failed public policy, uh, this is it. And it has been studied. There's been documentaries about it. Uh, and eventually, in 1976, it was Im exploded, dem demolished as it, it should have been. So in St. Louis now, and this is, uh, I talk about this in the book too, of the number of abandoned buildings, we have over 11,000 lots in abandoned buildings that actually belong to the city. So the city is the biggest landlord, and I would say slum landlord, mm -hmm. uh, that's allowing uh, pieces of property, some of them that once was in good shape, uh, to just decay. Um, and so, you know, you'll have buildings like this all over St. Louis. You know, and I can go, I can do this all day long, I'm telling you, all day long. And so it's not just housing, but abandoned manufacturing plants. And this one was next door to a, uh, a youth center, and it had, you know, bestest and everything else in it, but who cares about black kids? The other tragic thing for me, uh, as, as a former classroom teacher, is that schools have not escaped this. This is a school called Car School. Uh, that was down uh, in the projects that's been decaying literally for decades. Um, this is another one. There is a series of buildings that were designed by uh, architect uh, William Itner, and he, he's like renowned. And these buildings are languishing. Uh, they being the, they're not being demolished, really. But the, the other interesting part about the schools is they are real estate, and they're up on the market for real estate. But only the schools that have been abandoned on the south side have been bought and repurposed. And those are the ones that are on the predominantly white side of town. So the ones on the north side are going to look like this. So how do you create a viable community for real? How about if there are only two houses on the block? How do you, do, how do you build a community there? And literally, in some places, there's like one house on the block where all the other houses are abandoned. How do you build community if there's no institutions to anchor it, like schools or businesses? If there's no private or public investments? If there are policies in place to abandon and disinvest? And if there are no jobs with livable wages? And so you see the role that land, real estate, housing, communities have because that's also the place where you decide to live, grow your family, send your kids to school. And so there's a very interesting dynamic that happens when black schools are abandoned or um, in some places, particularly in 
the outer ring where places like Ferguson are, that when there were predominantly black uh, enclaves, those schools were closed and the black kids sent to white schools. So in, in many cases, you saw a destruction of communities on many different levels. You know, one of the things that I, I call out in the book is Bantu stands. That's what I see them as, because all of the black poor people have been like squeezed into certain areas uh, where there's nothing there, they're barren, and this is likened to what they did in South Africa with African Americans, I mean Africans. So Dr. Min Fully Love calls this root shock. When you have traumatic stress reaction to the loss of some of one's emotional ecosystem. And of course, it's not really just emotional, it's the cultural pieces, it's the um, financial pieces, it's the social pieces that just get destroyed as people get moved and moved. And I knew about, <coughs> excuse me, some of the uh, removals in St. Louis, like Mill Creek, because it's, it's really big. I knew about the uh, demolition of the uh, huge, huge uh, buildings, because I didn't tell you. Pure Igo was 33 high-rise buildings, 11 stories each, 33. It's a lot of damn people, y'all. So when you talk about what happens to these people when they get removed, it's not just a rhetorical question because we know what happened to them. But Fully Love puts a name to it, and it is root shock. And so when we talk about you know, post-traumatic stress, these are some of the things that come up in terms of why oppressed people respond and react to the way that they do. And we can talk some about gentrification and what impact that that's had on St. Louis, because I know it's happening here, too. OK, I'm going to do this. So I'm going to move to incarceration, because I really know incarceration well. Um, but you see here the national stats, and we got over 9 million people that are associated in some way with the criminal justice system. And, you know, uh, we are probably the only civilized, industrialized country that is, is incarcerating juveniles. You know, that's, that's really sad. Um, and, at, uh, you know, the state corrections expenditures are over, like, you know, into the millions of dollars. So, you know, this information comes from the sentencing project, but, you know, I pulled up, you know, Missouri's, and, you know, our stuff is not looking that good. We're looking kind of raggedy. So you got 11% population of African Americans, and the majority of folks, just like here in Madison, are folks of color. Now, I think it's interesting that Madison is 6% African American population. But you know, you all got some bad, bad rates when it comes to incarcerating black males. It's almost twice the, the, the national average. So I really want to hear what's, what's going on with that. Because, um, you know, it seems like there's a lot of work to be done there. So why do we have an addiction to incarceration is really purely economic. You know, um, some years ago, Amiri Baraka said that America has a Negro problem because we, you know, they brought us here, and then after you know slavery couldn't do that anymore, could they had to find ways of dealing with us, and so that's still happening. So in the U.S., it's 1,800 state and federal facilities costing anywhere from 80 to 100 billion dollars to operate. And in the U.S., that's thirty to sixty thousand dollars per uh, inmate. Sometimes it's less. Uh, places like California is about fifty thousand. Uh, in in Wisconsin is thirty, and in, in Missouri is twenty one thousand. So you got thirty two hundred local and county jails, and sometimes people stay in those places almost as long as some people stay in prison, waiting for uh, trial. So, so this is a, a very sad commentary in terms of we now have almost as many, and in, ca in some cases we do, uh, educational institutions. So who, who thought that that policy was sustainable or humane? 
So I think it's, you know, part of what we've been doing in, in Ferguson and before Ferguson, really, uh, is challenging and changing narratives because that's going to be really important. I, I tell young people the first battlefront is winning the hearts and minds of the people. And so, um, so there's certain narratives that are out there that need to be challenged, they need to be checked, they need to be dismantled. And one of them is that criminals are just, they're just growing and exploding and it, you know, if we don't do something, that's why the, the crime rate is going up. But what we know, and these are statistics by the, the FBI, not, these are not Jamala's statistics, because I know y'all ain't gonna believe me. These are people like the FBI who say that the violent offensives have been going down, y'all. That's the blue line. But yet, the incarceration rate is going up. There's a bit disconnect there. What are we gonna do about that? Is that okay with us? Because once that narrative is, we buy into it, that means that now police departments have the entree to say, we need bigger budgets, bigger guns, and we saw some of those on the streets of Ferguson, did we not? So, so they're ready. This first box comes from, uh, and, and help me pronounce that, y'all. That's one of the y'all. <laughs> yeah. So whatever that police department is, they've been, they've been busy. They have been busy. So, you know, 60% of the folks that they arrested were black, even though the black folks are only 4% of that population. So, so here's the thing. When we see this kind of skewed numbers, when we visually see a courtroom full of mainly black folks, when we see prisons mainly black folks, do we conclude that black people are inherently criminal? Because that's what we've done, y'all. They must, something must be going on. They must be doing the crime, because look how many of them it is. There's no white people in these courtrooms. The other narrative that has to be changed is, you know, and we use this one on uh, October 22nd, which is the National Day Against Police Brutality. And we were just, you know, so sick of this whole thing about the number of officers who've been killed in the line of duty and it's off the charts. Well, look at here, y'all. In 2015, uh, 1,200 people have been killed by the police. In 2014, 51 law enforcement officers were killed in the line of duty. Again, this is not Jamala saying this. This is y'all's FBI that you pay for. 51 officers. But all you hear from law enforcement is our men are afraid, our, our officers are afraid they've been killed in the street, they're threatened, they feel threatened, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so let's look at the numbers. I mean, I don't think anybody should be killed, but 51 compared to 1,200, really? You think y'all got a problem? So these are the kind of narratives that are out there, and I'm sure you can think of some more, and we can get into that. So in a post-Ferguson world, what are you prepared to do? And one of the things that we've really been trying to do is to bring in all of the folks who, based on the uprise and say, this is it, I gotta do something different. I didn't know all this stuff was going on, uh, especially with the courts, uh, using black people as ATM machines. Uh, I had, and, and, and I'm, I'm telling white people, don't be feeling guilty, just get in here and do the work to transform it. We don't need the guilt. Um, and I say that to black folks too, because some of them are kind of removed from situations once they try to move out to the suburbs. But this is the reality of black people in these municipalities, and I'm sure here. And if you have the, the leisure opportunity to read the DOJ report, you saw gross injustices all across the board, the racism in all levels, whether it be in the courts, the policing, all of that. And so what you have is communities that truly are under siege with nowhere to go. The other thing that just recently came out by um, ProPublica is a investigative piece on the kind of money that's been extorted from, again, the same people <coughs> as it relates to citations for housing, 
uh, for your property. So you got like nuisance things where you might have, uh, you might get a citation because you had trash. Starts out with a $25 citation and somehow ends up to be $800. So it's been cha-ching, cha-ching, cha-ching for a long time with no relief for these folks. So when St. Louis comes up on the map as one of the uh, most unbanked areas, Money requires what, y'all? I mean, a bank requires what? Money. If all your money is going to all of these different entities, paying for um, fines, paying attorneys to get you all, all of these, losing your job as a result of not being, uh, being in jail, or these are things that deeply impact the quality of life for uh, people in St. Louis and the region. And the other thing that I would add is just before Ferguson, there was a comprehensive report that was done by St. Louis University and Washington University where where you live makes a difference in terms of life and death. Not even quality of life, but life and death. So there's one particular municipality where those people live 40 years longer than folks in the city. 40 years. 40 years. And in St. Louis, by zip code, you could have, there's a zip code that they compared in the report that's like 18 years difference. So one of the things they try to point out in this report was that the health of African Americans in the region affects everybody. And I, I, I thought that maybe them saying that might have an impact on whether or not the policymakers were going to do something different. But again, I think it's because black people's lives are devalued. It's like, so what? I got my insurance. I'm living good. I'm living in Wildwood where I'm living 40 years uh, longer than most people. And, you know, I think the, the role of, of privilege and class shows up again and again and again. And even when you start to look at the exodus of, of white people from the city of St. Louis. Around like the turn of the century, St. Louis was the fourth largest city in the country. You know, it was a boom in metropolis on the Mississippi. And in about 1950, when it looked like there might be de desegregation, there was white flight. And then in the 60s, when black folks started to get some of the better paying jobs, they too moved out. So really, St. Louis is a shell of, uh, of a city reduced from uh, 850,000 to now like 350,000. One of the reasons I moved from Kansas City to St. Louis because I thought I was going to the big city. Now Kansas City is bigger than St. Louis. So my thing that I've talked about in the book and even in my columns I write is that we have some lackluster racist policy holders with no imagination about how do you build a city. Now if they knew, and I seem like to me this would be obvious, that there's going to be more people, working class people, middle class people than there are going to be rich people. But yet you try to create a city to keep rich white people in. Yeah. <laughs> and so policy after policy, project after project of tax dollars got us to the point where uh, we've invested millions and millions of, in things like the arch. Um, and. Um, you know, we've seen removal of black people, and we've seen total destructions of communities, including historically black municipalities, and, and nothing has been done. So those of us who came together post-Ferguson are really about changing laws, changing policies that are going to bring some relief to these communities. And uh, I think it's been amazing. I mean, some of them are uh, alliances that we never thought would happen. We just did a uh, radical reconciliation uh, a couple of weekends ago uh, where church people, you know, labor, uh, students, folks came together. Um, and we invited some of the policymakers and decision makers, because I don't call them leaders. They are elected officials, but they aren't leaders. So we had a table. You, see, you told us to come out of the streets, come to the policy table to make these changes. Here we are, and the ones that were the most had the most power to make decisions, chose not to show up, even some of them who had already committed. So we had to take the table to them, y'all. So that was Sunday. Monday morning, we went to City Hall with a table like this. Said, Mayor, since you didn't come to us, we come to you. 
And did we not get a meeting with the mayor that's gonna be a town hall on November 23rd? Yeah. But here's the thing, y'all. I'm telling people, we don't have time for these games. We really don't. People's lives are literally at stake. So are you gonna make us have to fight for the changes that you already know are happening? There were 189 actions and recommendations that came out of the Ferguson Commission report. You know how bad this situation is, and you're playing games. You can't come to a meeting. And then when they found out there was 1,000 people there in the uh, St. Louis University, they started figuring out how can they now get back in in good graces. But we had already, like, you know, muddied up their name all over, you know, Twitter and Facebook and everywhere else we could. Yeah. So we need to hold people accountable. We need to hold the people who have the power. And they only had the power, y'all, because we gave it to them. <laughs> they elected. They're using our tax dollars. And I have to remind people of that who, the, even the poorest people, you still have a right to say what happens to your hard earned money. So all of us have a stake in this, all of us. And so I really want to open it now to hear about some of the things that you want to know about Ferguson or that you see some similarities between Ferguson and St. Louis and Madison. Uh, <laughs> but really the challenge is what are you going to do in a post-Ferguson world? How are you going to change how you are as a person? How are you going to change the institutions, uh, particularly the one that we're in now? Because um, I know it's some blood on their hands. And uh, the communities. And even on a professional level, wh how are we going to make these changes so that we have a, a, a better society where all people are valued? Thank you.